this is a bit of a different episode. Step back, take stock of the amazing different conversations that I've had with incredible entrepreneurs. Single most important skill. And the word sales has become dirty now. Just looking after the company's top asset. Both these women actually stopped and thought about who they were going to make rich one day. Hey, strategy and tragedy listeners, welcome to the show. If this is your first time listening, then please hit that subscribe button and make sure that you listen to episode zero for a proper introduction. Or if you've been following the podcast for a while, then you'll know that this is a bit of a different episode format. Today, I'm trying something new and a bit scary by doing a solo piece. I wanted to use this opportunity to step back, take stock of the amazing different conversations that I've had with incredible entrepreneurs over the past few months and reflect on some of the most common themes that have come up on the show so far. But before I do, can you guess what they are? If you've been listening to the show for a while now, then take a moment. What have been some of the top lessons learned that have come up time and time again in my interviews? While I let you think, I wanna give a warm welcome to any new listeners here and share a very important message to all of you. I wanna thank you so much to tuning into my show. I read online that there are about 4 million podcasts out there and only so many hours in your very busy days. So if you're making the time to listen to this out of the other 3,999,000 other podcasts and I am super grateful to you. All right, let's get into it, shall we? So the very first thing that we'll dive into is sales. Sales is the single most important skill that you need in business as a founder, as a leader. Yes, you need vision, but you also need to sell it. You need to sell in that vision to your team, to your investors, to your partners, and of course, into your customers. Without customers, we have no business. Two interviews in particular came up with this top theme. One with the co-founder of Design My Night, Nick Telson Sillett, where he talked about this more as an angel investor and what he looks for in a backable team. I don't care if you're an engineer um, or if you're normally behind the laptop, like the founder has to be able to sell. If, if one of you cannot sell to investors, to customers, to your team, you have to be a salesperson. Um, so that for me, the best founders I've come across have that sales instinct as well. The other interview where this came up was with Mona Teasler, who also happens to be an investor, but talked about it more as part of the most overlooked and much needed skill that she needed when she was going through her entrepreneurial journey. The biggest challenge was definitely the sales because you really, in order to survive, in order to build this company, in order to be able to hire people to help you, to work with you, to be on this trajectory with you, you needed to make enough revenue to pay their salaries and the insurance and all these things, right? So you went out and you were like, how do I sell? You see, the thing is learning to sell doesn't get taught in schools and the word sales has become dirtied now honestly caused by bad salespeople in the past. It conjures up images of secondhand car salesmen, dodgy Del Boy style wheeler dealers, or worst of all, pesky bloody estate agents. I cannot stand estate agents. Even in job titles now, the term has all but disappeared. You're either in business development or customer success or commercial or revenue. Of course, the trendy new term now, which I love, is buyer enablement. (laughs) Enablement, you're an enabler. I just think that's fantastic. Whatever we call it, the fact remains that sales is a non-negotiable, crucial part of business. We move on to the next juicy topic that's come up over and over on the show, and it's investment. Whether you do it for four hours from memory on TV, like Heinen Zhang and Charlotte Morley did on BBC's Dragon's Den, or you try to schmooze VCs and angel investors most of the founders interviewed on the show have their own war stories when it comes to securing external capital for their businesses. Here are the things I was most surprised to learn about their investment stories. In one of my earlier episodes, episode four, with Graham Hussey, the founder and CEO of Dream Factory, he actually shared the story of turning down VC funding. He had this dream offer on his plate and he turned it down. I'm still in shock. You'll have to go back and listen to that episode for the full story and his reasons why. That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. If they're going to own half your business, you don't even know what it is yet. 
Also, confession, it just so happens to be one of my favorite episodes. So I recommend that you go back and listen to that one anyway. Moving on, a really helpful, practical tip that I took away from my conversation with Varun Banut of Magic AI, which was in episode two, was around his angel investor strategy. He started with nothing, but he and his co-founder managed to persuade someone to invest a small amount of money just to kickstart the engine. They then use this FOMO tactic, which does happen to work quite well on investors, by the way, to get other angels on board, i.e. so-and-so's on board, we've now got two signed up, two then turn into four, we've now got four, six then sign up, and eventually they get that snowball effect. We just need some money <laughs> so we don't die. And um, we we won a few initial angels, no one high, high profile or anything like that, um, who, who were just willing to put in a bit of money um when i say a bit of money i mean i think they must have done like a thousand pounds so so like very little okay. money but we were able to then take that and say go out to other people and say look we've already got some people on board we didn't tell them how much they were on board for so look we've got some people on board it's this guy and this guy and eventually sort of one became two and two became four and four became eight. Baron also shared how he got top dog Dan Murray Serta to invest in his business too. So maybe add that episode to your save list after this one as well. A radical discovery I made about the whole VC investment game was while I was interviewing Nina Mahanti, the co-founder of Blue Money in episode 13 and Kristen Cardwell, the co-founder of Sorcery in episode 15. Both these women actually stopped and thought about who they were going to make rich one day, i.e. who they wanted on their cap tables. And sometimes I pitch folks and I'm having to justify that immigrants exist. <laughs> Like, it's full stop. It's more money than we originally set out to raise, actually. Now, obviously, we don't all have the luxury to pick and choose who we want to take a couple of million dollars from, please and thank you. But I'd never heard of founders switching the dynamic in this way and really having that longer term thinking. It feels so obvious now that I know it and now I'm talking about it, but it was a consideration I'd never heard before and might be new for you, too. Of course, there are also lots of crazy nightmare stories or tragedies, if you will, that are peppered throughout strategy and tragedy, which goes to show what a roller coaster founder life can be. Which brings me very nicely onto the next topic, which is self care. Self care is not selfish. Taking care of yourself is just looking after the company's top asset, its director. Think about it. If your job was to look after the company's number one asset, how would you treat it? How would you fuel and nourish it? How would you ensure it was operating in the best way possible? How would you increase its performance, its longevity, its creativity, its output, maybe even its happiness? I reckon today we take better care of our phones than we do ourselves. They get recharged fully every night, they get full protection, and we always keep them safe. The subject of wellness and founder health has come up in most of my conversations on here. A particular interview with Tom Adeyula in episode 12 revealed he overworked himself so badly that eventually he came down with a paralyzing migraine and other health conditions that just forced him to stop. And then I got a bout of terrible headaches and I couldn't get out of bed for 10 days. Um, and the like I was, the, the only thing that worked from a medication perspective was beta blockers. The body sends us signals all the time, and the longer we ignore them, the greater we crash. Now, whilst looking after our own well-being is within our control, the last theme I'll share with you today, annoyingly, is not within our control. It's timing. For better or worse, we can never escape the chains of time. Some entrepreneurs might be too early to market, like Charlotte Morley's The Little Loop, where there is a validated demand, but not fully experienced that proper lift off yet. Some entrepreneurs were too late in capturing a market or adopting new technologies, like Don Fendius in episode eight. To fix that, if we'd sort of moved faster and got it user generated, but as I say, that the user generated thing became exponentially easier with the iPhone. And we were just too slow, really. Some entrepreneurs sold their businesses too early. Again, like Tom Adeyula, I mentioned before, whose business would have been worth triple if he'd waited just six months. 
Of course, we can never know if we're too early or too late or what's just around the corner. And it can drive us mad trying to figure out this impossibility. There's a poetic dichotomy here, if I may say, of both an equalizing fairness and simultaneously an infuriating unfairness in this. What do I mean exactly here? It's incredibly frustrating to work so hard and despite all your best efforts, the element of timing is just always out of your control. As entrepreneurs, this is unacceptable. Entrepreneurs are builders, creators, masters of our own destiny. So to have something permanently out of their control, however hard they try to work at it, is just infuriating. On the flip side, the equalizing aspect of timing adds a luck of the draw element to the game. Some will get lucky, others won't. All we can do is maximize our chances of success by putting in the work and managing the mind during those ups and downs. It kind of reminds me of that prayer to leave you with. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Listeners, thank you once again from the bottom of my heart for tuning into this episode, especially if you made it this far. I really hope that you enjoy the show and I'm so excited for the next episodes that I've got coming up for you. I also want to express my sincere gratitude to the incredible guests who have come on the show, who have shared their authentic stories in such an open way and for supporting the show by sharing it with the networks. So again, whether this is your first time listening in, whether you've subscribed and followed from the very beginning, whether you've shared a post on social media, or if you've supported the show as a patron, I'm so very grateful to you and continue to produce interviews for you to find education and inspiration. Take care until next time. <laughs>